Aloha. We're in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Right over there, in 12 meters of water, lies a 185 meter ship in her final resting place. When Japanese naval aviation attacked the naval base at Pearl Harbor, the battleship Arizona took bomb hits and then became a tomb for a thousand officers and men. Other American battleships were also sent to the shallow bottom. December 7, 1941 is a tragic day in US history. It was a day of defeat, but it also gave rise to a great victory, albeit at enormous effort and countless victims. Before that day, though, almost nobody in the world had heard of Pearl Harbor or Oahu. The Hawaiian Islands are comprised of more than 20 islands and atolls. They are located in the northern part of the Pacific Ocean, almost in the middle between North America and Asia. The islands represent a very important strategic location for the USA, which is why they were annexed by the states at the turn of the 20th century. The territory of Hawaii, as was the case in World War II, to be able to use that as a jump off point for their Navy or Air Forces. Um, and given the limitations of fuel capacity in the Second World War, a lot of airplanes didn't have the ability to fly from North America to Asia as they do today. So Hawaii was a way for uh, a lot of that hardware to come to the central of area of the Pacific and to be used in, uh, in warfare. At the very beginning of 1941, the commander of the combined Japanese fleet, Admiral Yamamoto Isoroku, stated his opinion that a sudden strike against the US fleet stationed at the Hawaiian Islands would inflict maximum damage to the enemy and buy Japan some time to capture the resource-rich territories that Japan badly needed. The mission seemed impossible. The Hawaiian Islands and Japan were separated by a distance of more than 4,000 miles. There was an entire chain of airfields on the island, Hikum, Wheeler, Ewa, Kaneoe, Halaiwa, and Bellows, all of which could launch aircraft to fend off an enemy attack. This is the best remaining example of a Nakajima B5N2 torpedo bomber. The Americans called it a Kate. And 142 of these aircraft were used on the raid on Pearl Harbor. During training exercises, it was observed that the torpedoes, after being dropped in shallow water, would simply embed themselves into the sea floor. But by autumn of 1941, a new development of the Type 91 torpedo was released. And this used a new angular acceleration control system that was unique in the world. Externally, what you would see would be these two fins here, which would be used for roll control. And also you can see on the tail, the wooden panels that were added for better aerodynamics during the drop, they would detach upon hitting the water. But what this all meant was that a torpedo could now be used in the 17 meter depth of Pearl Harbor. December 7th was not the original date, it was November 20th and uh, they had been training their pilots for months. The pilots for the torpedo planes and the uh, fighter planes and the dive bombers had been in training specifically for at least four months uh, for this operation. Operation Hawaii was a uh, very big secret in Japan. Uh, many of the pilots did not know the mission until they were assigned to the carrier and were actually practicing. Some of them were practicing not knowing exactly what the, what the target was at the time. There was an entire ordinance um, secrecy also. For a long while, the Japanese lacked a bomb capable of penetrating the thick armor of US battleships, but they set their engineers to the problem. The solution they came up with was quite novel. You start with an obsolete 410 millimeter battleship round, you repurpose it to become an aerial bomb, and suddenly the Japanese now have a new highly capable form of ordnance, as in particular USS Arizona would discover. The 
The fate of Pearl Harbor was decided at the beginning of November 1941. On November 4, the command structure of the Imperial Japanese Navy approved the mission plan, and the 5th commander of the combined Japanese fleet issued Combat Order 1 for the attack on Pearl Harbor. Two days later, Admiral Yamamoto approved the final date of the attack, Sunday, December 7. And in fact, it was determined by a very prominent Japanese spy who worked at the Japanese consulate on Oahu that Sunday morning would be the absolute best time to attack, and that's why they planned it, because he knew that the surprise element would be magnified so much. On November 22, all 30 ships of the task force had gathered in Hitokapu Bay on Iturup Island. Six aircraft carriers, two battleships, three cruisers, nine destroyers, three submarines, seven oil tankers. The carriers had the following aircraft on their decks. 40 torpedo bombers armed with torpedoes, 135 dive bombers, 104 torpedo bombers armed with bombs, 129 fighters. 408 aircraft in total. There were many difficulties uh, in planning this and what they actually uh, uh, experienced when they came across. One was the heavy seas, uh, the pitching of the, uh, the uh, aircraft carriers during the weather for launch and takeoff. The other was uh, they were under a radio blackout, uh, so they very minimal kind of uh, communications, much of it just uh, conning tower to conning tower, kind of light signals and flags. The last radio message received by the Japanese staff from the Rassets at Honolulu came from a spy, Takeo Yushikawa. The message read as follows. Vessels Morton Harbor, nine battleships, three Class B cruisers, three seaplane tenders, 17 destroyers. Entering harbor are four Class B cruisers, three destroyers. All aircraft carriers and heavy cruisers have departed harbor. No signs of any changes in US fleet or anything unusual. The Japanese staff were disappointed to hear that there were no aircraft carriers at the base, but they did not cancel the operation. The ships were blacked out and set a course to Oahu Island at full speed. The famous signal flag Z was raised on the mast of the Japanese flagship, aircraft carrier Akagi. The flag is one of the most treasured relics of the Japanese Navy. 36 years prior, when this signal had appeared on armor-clad Mikasa, it symbolized the legendary order that Admiral Togo had delivered to his fleet before the Battle of Tsushima broke out. The fate of the Empire rests on the outcome of this battle. Let every man do his utmost duty. On December 7, 1941, that order was delivered again to every serviceman who set out on that dangerous raid. In addition to an airborne attack by Japanese deck aviation, the Hawaiian Islands were also subjected to an attack by submarines deployed near Oahu Island. They were ready to destroy any US ship that attempted to flee from the harbor during the aviation attack. Moreover, five of the Japanese submarines carried midget two-man submarines on their decks. remained in a state of blissful ignorance, and the parties continued on into the night. Even the radio station, if you happened to turn it on, was playing a series of light and amusing tunes. It was a Sunday, and you know, a lot of, a lot of ships had actually been prepared before the December 7th on Saturday for an inspection on Sundays. A lot of the 
uh, normally functioning battle spaces had been prepared for inspection and not necessarily being manned at the state that they would have been. So it was an unfortunate twist of fate. Privates Joseph Lockhart and George Elliott were on watch at the Army's radar post on Opana Mountain. At the end of their shift, suddenly a very large return appeared on their display. Only a very large airborne group could cause such a return. There was no time to waste. At 7.06, they reported their findings. A very large signal due north 137 miles out to the watch officer, a young lieutenant at the information center. Excuse me, sir, this is Private Lockhart. I believe a large flight of planes are approaching slightly east of north of Oahu at a distance of about 130 miles. Lieutenant Kermit Tyler was told by an aviation friend of his, hey, if you ever hear the music playing at 3 a.m., it's because we're expecting an incoming flight of aircraft from the mainland. So when he got in his vehicle that morning to come to work, turned on his radio, there was music playing. Normally it would have been static because they didn't pay DJs to play music at 2, 3, 4 in the morning. So he knew that they were using that as a way to allow incoming pilots to hone in on Hawaiian Islands, given the navigational challenges of flying 2,500 miles across open ocean. Rather infamously, the officer told them it was most likely a flight of B-17s inbound from California. Don't worry about it. Thank you, sir. aviators thought this was their final mission. They didn't believe that it would be a complete and total surprise the way it was. Of course, so, so the heroism just to get in the cockpit, you know, I think if you're an 18 or 19 or 20 year old aviator and, and know that you're flying off of a ship 200 miles from an island, 3,000 miles from your homeland, um, I can't imagine what that would have been like for them. The targets of the torpedo bombers and Kate bombers were seven battleships that were moored in the battleship row near Ford Island. 51 dive bombers were ordered to bomb air bases Hickam and Wheeler and Ford Island. That airborne attack was to be supported by 43 Zero fighters. Apart from the aforementioned air bases, the fighters also had to attack airfields Ewa and Kaneohe. At 7.55, the crews of the ships were preparing to raise the colors. On Nevada, they will be accompanied by the ship's band, 23 personnel, including the conductor. At 7.58, the conductor noticed aircraft coming in over the harbor, and shortly thereafter, the line of ships was rocked by underwater explosions. Nevertheless, at 8 a.m. sharp, the band began to play the national anthem. The memories of those sailors who survived the attack describe that first terrifying assault the best. Aviation metalsmith second class Adolf Kuhn on Ford Island. A Japanese pilot swooped down low in front of me where I could see his Bombay doors open. He released a huge bomb heading straight for my tractor. I said to myself, Adolf, this is it, we sure. With my foot on my brake and hands on top of my head like I did in a little crowded boat earlier, I prayed again. After all, I'd missed mass this morning. I saw the bomb into the concrete runway, ripping out huge chunks of cement lace and reinforcing steel, which landed on nearby rooftops and equipment, while smaller pieces hit my tractor and bounced off, some hitting my arm and shoulder. Again, I thanked my guardian angel. Signalman Second Class Richard E. Burge, USS Tennessee. 
I watched the fleet destroyed right before my eyes. I watched the fleet destroyed right before my eyes. The USS Arizona was anchored 50 feet to the stern of our ship. She took several bombs and torpedoes, raised up, and quickly sank to the bottom of the harbor. USS West Virginia and USS Oklahoma took several torpedoes. The West Virginia sank alongside us. The USS Oklahoma, which was anchored forward of the West Virginia, capsized completely. The USS Maryland, anchored forward of us, took a bomb and its bow sank. Well, people often want to know what damage was uh, received in the first few minutes of the air raid, and the answer to that is it was it was quite a quite a lot. In fact, the surprise is one of the uh, fundamentals of war, and the Japanese used that with overwhelming success. You have to remember this: the aircraft carrier had never been used before the way that that enemy aviation was being used against the United States on December 7th, 1941. So they didn't really feel like it was a practical possibility for there to be an airborne attack against Oahu. It was raid planner and first wave commander Mitsuo Fuchida who had sent the signal Tora, Tora, Tora to the carrier Akagi. This signal meant two things. First, complete surprise had been attained. And second, World War II had just expanded to the Pacific. In December 1941, 0758, the following message was transmitted to all ships in the Hawaii area. It would then, of course, be forwarded on to the commanders of the Atlantic and Asiatic fleets and the commander in chief in Washington, D.C. Air raid on Pearl Harbor. This is not drill. I was four or five feet into the Joe mess when the first torpedo hit. It was an explosion I will never forget. The noise was a very well muffled blast. You could tell it was deep in the bottom of the ship as the ship was lifted rapidly straight off a considerable distance. I don't think it would be far off in estimating it as 24 to 30 inches. My legs almost buckled and I reached out my arms to avoid being thrown to the deck. I did not fall, but I caught myself and then knew for sure that this was no drill. The day of infamy had arrived. Ensign Adolph D. Mortensen, USS Oklahoma. At 8.10 a.m., when the commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, Admiral Husband Kimmel, arrived at HQ, the main forces of his fleet had been already forced out of action. Admiral Kimmel and Admiral Short had a golf match planned for later Sunday morning. So he was most likely, uh, just like everyone else, completely surprised. What I found most interesting in my research that uh, happened when it comes to Admiral Kimmel's response to the attack was as he sat in his headquarters, which overlooks Pearl Harbor here, he was wa watching the decimation of his fleet. And a spent American anti-aircraft round actually came back, pierced the window he was looking, for, th looking through, and smudged his navy white uniform. And he looked down at the time, and it's reported that he said, it would have been better had it killed me. By that time, three battleships, Arizona, Oklahoma, and West Virginia had already been sunk. California was still afloat, but she was doomed. Maryland and Tennessee had been damaged by aerial bombs and were blocked by a ship that had been moored nearby and then ran aground. Nevada was hit by a torpedo, but she still attempted to start moving. Ships located on the other side of Ford Island were damaged as well. Despite all that hell, the ship crews were organizing their defenses and opening fire in return. Man your battle stations was echoed amongst the fleet. So those that were available uh, rushed to their battle stations.
And it's one of my favorite stories because there was an American priest, a chaplain, a uh, religious service member who was working on an American ship. And he encouraged his shipmates by, by saying to them, everyone praise the Lord, but please pass the ammunition. Um, so uh, yes, there was, uh, there was a lot of confusion at first, but um, following the initial attack, the, the American response was much higher. This is the USS Oklahoma Memorial. Each one of these columns represents a sailor who was killed on just that one ship on the morning of December 7th, 41. Once the initial shock and surprise of the attack had been gotten over, the sailors manned their systems and started to fight back. There are various stories of determination. For example, there was a sailor aboard USS Maryland had been put into the brig for fighting the night before. Well, they released him when the alarm was sounded and he started carrying shells up ladders until finally he collapsed to the deck unconscious. Dory Miller, who's a famous uh, African-American who received the Navy Cross because he was called to the bridge of the West Virginia to remove the wounded captain. He was mortally wounded. The captain subsequently refused to be removed from the bridge. So Dory Miller thought, well, hey, while I'm up here, I might as well do something. He went outside and started operating an anti-aircraft machine gun that he had never been trained on. The second attack started at 7.15 a.m. 54 bombers, 78 dive bombers, and 35 fighters took off. 36 more fighters remained on the carriers to provide cover on Admiral Nagumo's orders. It was very um, important to the Japanese aviators that they uh, neutralize the PBYs and amphibious planes uh, from uh, being able to go and find their task force. The first bomb that was dropped on uh, Fort Island uh, eventually burned a hangar uh, that had a very large number of PBYs out front. Other targets included uh, airfields because they did for the same reason they didn't want heavy bombers or uh, any aircraft getting off the ground and locating the fleet. Just one plane discovering where uh, the fleet uh, had, uh, the Japanese fleet had launched the planes from would have been uh, uh, a catastrophe because then the U.S. forces would know um, where to intercept them or to attempt to, uh, to sink them. That morning at Hickam Field, you'd find 12 B-17 bombers, 12 A-20 bombers, 30 older B-18 bombers. The Japanese would destroy most of the American aircraft on the ground, either in the hangars or out on the airfield itself, side by side, wingtip to wingtip, as if on parade. Any American pilot that tried to get into the air was shot down. Lieutenants Kenneth Taylor and George Welch would prove to be an exception. Taylor and Welch called ahead and managed to make it to the satellite airfield from where they were able to take off and enter the maelstrom, immediately taking attention from Japanese fighters. Somehow over the course of the next two hours, using multiple airfields, these two pilots were able to land, rearm, refuel, and get back up into the fight. By the end of the day, they were credited with at least six confirmed kills. 
Also in the second wave, uh, the dive bombers were meeting uh, heavy resistance, the anti-aircraft um, uh, sites on, on the uh, shore and also mostly on the ships had been supplied with their ammunition, lockers had been finally opened, and the sailors were um, looking up and, and, and Marines were actually shooting with M1s and, and there was quite a resistance at the time and as I said, the, um, uh, the uh, anti-aircraft uh, fire was all over uh, the overhead, in fact, uh, was firing so much that a lot of it was uh, falling on Honolulu, the city. And uh, so uh, it, was, it was a very um, difficult thing to fly into, and it was where they sustained most of their, their losses. Of course, it wasn't just the military that would fall victim to the raid. A number of civilians were killed as well. Civilian involvement was inevitable as those who were nearby would render aid to crewmen coming off sunken vessels or to those who were wounded by fire. And even in this, there were a number of noteworthy stories. Pennsylvania was in dry dock number one. When the Japanese dive bombers launched an offensive on the battleship, a civilian crane operator came to rescue. He moved the crane along the rails of the dock wall and blocked the path for low-flying enemy aircraft with the crane arm, thus forcing them to break off from their attack course. A bomb exploded near the crane and destroyed it. But the sacrifice of the worker had made a real difference. The battleship had taken just minor damage and was still able to fire. At around 10 a.m., the Japanese attack concluded. Their aircraft turned back and flew off to the north. The airplane of Captain Fukida stayed over Oahu Island for some time, so the pilot could take photos of the U.S. base after the attack. A devastating strike was inflicted on the U.S. Pacific Fleet on December 7, 1941. Out of eight battleships, none remained in service. Arizona, West Virginia, California, and Oklahoma had been sunk. Nevada had run aground. Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Tennessee were heavily damaged. Light cruisers Helena, Honolulu, and Raleigh had also received damage and were forced out of action for a long time. Destroyers Downs and Cassin were destroyed. Shaw was heavily damaged. 174 Army and Naval aircraft were completely destroyed. 121 more aircraft received severe damage. Some of them would later be decommissioned. 3,581 people were killed or wounded as a result of the attack. The Japanese squadron lost 29.
a solemn agreement whereby peace may be restored. World War II ended that morning. In 1998, the ship upon which that final signature was applied to bring the war to a close was relocated to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. She is now moored just 460 meters away from where the war started for the Americans with the sinking of another battleship, USS Arizona. The story of the US's involvement in World War II thus has been drawn full circle.